So far, we've spent a lot of time this semester talking about implied main ideas in paragraphs. And actually, what implied main ideas require of us is the ability to inference from the details what the main message of the passage is. But we can go far farther with inferences, and we can also use this skill to be able to link together information that appears in supporting details. That's not something that we've concentrated on so far. So sometimes the writer wants you to make a connection between two details, but doesn't directly state that. Here's an example. Schools sometimes encourage sexual stereotypes through the teaching materials used. One survey of children's readers found that although boys and girls were portrayed with almost equal frequency, girls were more often presented as in need of rescue and boys were rarely shown during doing housework or displaying emotions. Now, in that particular paragraph, we need to supply some additional information in the form of an inference. So if we have this paragraph, which appears here again, which of the following choices on slide 26 is the best that boys appear more frequently than girls do in standard teaching materials? that girls are in need of rescue and boys do not display emotion are stereotypes. In elementary school textbooks, girls are frequently shown displaying their emotions. Well, if you selected B, you're correct, because in sentences A and C, we can't find information or details that would support that information. However, B can be supported by the information that appears in that paragraph. Let's try another one. So what essential detail do you need to supply for this passage in order to make sense? Anytime you wake up the morning after a snowstorm to find two feet of fresh powder piled up in your driveway, you can guarantee that leaving your house is going to be difficult. Driving especially is going to be dangerous. So which is an appropriate inference of these details? That automobile accidents are more frequent after a snowfall? that snow on the roads makes travel more difficult because driving becomes more dangerous, or that poor visibility during a snowstorm is a major cause of automobile accidents. Living in Wisconsin, if you have for any amount of time, you know that all three of these are probably true, but that's not what we can infer from the information that's given in the details of this paragraph. So let's take a look at each one again. Accidents increase more um, after a snowfall. That can't be supported with the details that are provided in the paragraph above. Nor can poor visibility during a snowstorm being a major cause of automobile accidents. So the only thing that we can support and infer correctly from the paragraph is that snow on the roads makes travel more difficult because driving becomes more dangerous. If you like, you can pause the uh, PowerPoint video at this point and go ahead and complete exercise six or you can simply stay tuned and finish up this PowerPoint video. Your choice. Another thing that we have to learn how to do is to infer conclusions. This is really a very special type of inference. It's not related to just the contents of a paragraph, but it's what's stated throughout the passage and our ability to link together those main ideas and infer what it is that the author means. Sometimes we draw inferences that weren't necessarily intended by the author, but perhaps the author's bias was not, you know, carefully checked against. And when we draw a conclusion and make an inference to come to that conclusion, we're drawing a conclusion about the author and perhaps his or her bias or her viewpoints on the topic, or we're drawing a conclusion about someone that's discussed in the passage or something else, some other issue that might be mentioned in the passage as well. Like implied main ideas, conclusions can either be considered either logical or illogical. So a logical conclusion is going to be based on what was actually said in the passage. Think about the example that we just went over with the results of driving after a heavy snowfall. Illogical ones are based more on our own past experience or common sense rather than what's stated in the passage. And 
Sometimes illogical conclusions might be true statements, but they're just not supported by what the author says. So with drawing conclusions, you can tell that we're relying more heavily on the text than we are just on our own life's experiences. Let's take a look at this example. Around 150 AD, a fabulously wealthy patron of the arts, Herodes Atticus, who built a theater in Athens that can still be seen today, had a son who had trouble learning the alphabet and thus could not read. To help his son, the father gave 24 of his servants one specific task, to represent the name of a single letter of the, from the alphabet. On a daily basis, the servants were to appear before Atticus's son, call out their name, and hold up the symbols that they represented. Although it may have taken a while, the boy presumably learned the entire alphabet and eventually became a good reader. So, based on this, which of these conclusions could logically be drawn from this passage? So now we're moving to slide 31. The son of Herodes Atticus was pretending that he couldn't read despite his father. Herodes Atticus was placed, has placed a high value on being able to read. His son's problems with reading taught Herodes Atticus a hard lesson. Money doesn't buy happiness. Or, like all wealthy Greeks of the time, Herodes Atticus considered slaves to be property rather than people. Well, we don't find anything in the passage that would lead us to believe that the son was, you know, sort of playing mind games with his father and refusing to learn to read. So it could rule out A. And we don't find anything about Herodes Atticus's attitude towards slaves, so D doesn't seem to fit. And C discusses, you know, the fact that money can't buy happiness, but that isn't really supported in any way by the by the paragraph either, which leaves us with choice B as being the correct answer, that he placed a high value on being on his son being able to read. What conclusion can you draw about the author's attitude toward letting the federal government oversee the laws of individual states? So, we're on slide 32, and when I finish reading this paragraph, I want you to pause the video and state what conclusion you think can be drawn. And again, the, the topic we know is the difference between uh, federal government controlling uh, and individual states and the proportion of power. So here we go. In September of 2010, Randy Barnett, a law professor from Georgetown University, and William J. Howell, speaker of the Virginia House of Delegates, wrote an editorial for the Wall Street Journal, arguing in favor of what's called the Repeal Amendment. The Repeal Amendment would give two-thirds of the states the power to repeal or revoke any federal law or regulation. At the heart of the Barnett and Howell's argument was the belief that the federal government has grown too powerful and has gone too far in its attempt to solve social problems that should be left in the hands of individuals. In their eyes, the repeal amendment would act as a necessary corrective. It would give the states more power and the government less. So again, jot down for slide 32 what conclusion you might be able to draw about the author's attitude toward letting the federal government oversee the laws of individual states. And if you'd like more time, feel free to pause this. So which of these conclusions then follows from the statements made in the passage? The authors of the editorial believe that there should be prayer in the schools. The authors believe that the states do not have the right to impose a personal income tax. Only the federal government has the right to impose taxes. The authors are likely to support the idea that the federal government can penalize those citizens who choose not to purchase health insurance. Since we know that the authors really are in favor of states' rights and feel that the federal government has too much control, we can probably rule out B, 
because that seems to be that statement seems to be giving more credence to the federal government having more power. In A, we really don't see anything in that article or that paragraph about religion or prayer in the schools, which leaves us to conclude that C is most likely that the authors wouldn't readily support the idea that the federal government could impose a penalty on those citizens who decide not to purchase health insurance, since the authors are indeed in favor of more individual rights or states' rights. So here's a final wrap-up for you. What words or phrases do you think are significant in the following paragraph, and why would you single them out? What's the main idea of this paragraph, and is that main idea stated? or implied. So we're on slide 34 at this point. For some scientists, being happy is a matter of genetics. As this group sees it, people are genetically programmed to be upbeat or depressed. A much smaller group of scientists, however, disagrees. One of those who disagrees is a psychologist by the name of Sonia L, is how we'll refer to her, of the University of California. She and her colleagues argue that certain kinds of thinking can encourage happiness in people who might otherwise not feel so great. After reviewing 51 studies that tested attempts to increase happiness through positive thinking, Dr. L concluded that certain kinds of behavior or thought can increase feelings of happiness. Expressions of gratitude, for example, seem to make people feel better about the world. In one study, people who wrote letters of gratitude generally felt better after having done so. The effect was felt even by those who did not send the letters. Participants in another study were asked to visualize themselves in a happy situation and think about how they might make that a rosy future a reality. These subjects, too, reported a more positive outlook, as did those who counted their blessings on a regular basis. Who knows? Maybe it's true that there is power in positive thinking. So now, at this point, you have three questions to answer on slide 34. What words or phrases seem to stand out and are repeated throughout this particular paragraph? Thinking about those chains of repetition that we've talked about in the chapter so far. Jot that, the, those words down. And then the second part of that question, slides question is, so what's the main idea of the paragraph? What point is the author trying to make? And then finally, is that main idea stated or implied? Here's another sample passage. One of the best first pets was Fala, Franklin D. Roosevelt's Black Scottish Terrier. The dog went everywhere with Roosevelt, once making the news when he was accidentally left behind on a trip in the Aleutian Islands. Roosevelt's Republican opponents accused him of spending $8 million to send a ship back to fetch the dog. However, the president's affection for his dog only increased his popularity and probably helped Roosevelt win his historic fourth term. But Fala is not the only famous first pet. President Richard Nixon's dog, Checkers, is credited with saving Nixon's political career. In a 1952 speech on national television, Nixon defended accusations of financial irregularities by acknowledging the receipt of just one personal gift, Checkers. Tearfully, Nixon claimed he would never give up Checkers. Gerald Ford's dog, Liberty, was so popular that the cast of the TV comedy show SNL often included Liberty in their skits about the president. Millie, the Springer Spaniel belonging to George and Barbara Bush, appeared as the author of a New York Times best-selling book. Then First Lady Hillary Clinton increased the fame of first pets with her book, Dear Socks, Dear Buddy, Kids' Letters to the First Pets. President Obama encouraged interest in his family's pet by making the search for a dog public, a public event. Eventually, the family settled on Bo, a Portuguese water dog, who has become one of the most photographed pooches of all time. So, which conclusion do you think you could draw from this paragraph? Would you say the paragraph supports A, 
Democrats like dogs more than Republicans. B. Presidents may love their dogs, but they also use them for, pu for public relations. C. How presidents treat their dogs can reveal a lot about their presidential character. D. Many presidential dogs have become more famous than their owners. And make your selection. And that concludes part two of the chapter six PowerPoint on the topic of inferences.